Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the UIMS Differential Diagnosis Series, uh, where we aim to really uh, make you think with logic. Uh, so because differential diagnosis can be a tedious task and knowing which ones to choose and which ones to not and how broad it should be and how narrow it should be is quite important. So this the aim of this lecture is to really provide a framework of differential diagnosis rather than asking you to rather than giving you cases and form a differential diagnosis. Because if you know the frameworks, then possibly you could apply them in your clinical practice. Uh, yeah, so possibly you could apply them in your clinical practice. So generating a differential diagnosis at first will be quite hard, but eventually with practice, you should be able to do it. So as I said, uh, the aim of this lecture is to really provide a framework of differential diagnosis, which will include how, which ones to choose at which, which is the right time, and what are the rules that should be used when we are generating differential diagnosis. So yeah, so there are five steps to always generating a good differential diagnosis. Number one is obviously acquiring data. So you use all the available sources. Generally, when we generate a differential diagnosis, we always just focus on patient symptoms. We don't really fall into a bias. The problem that we face is always generating a bias. For instance, if a person comes with chest pain, we will always think that most of the times we would think it's an MI. But obviously, we have to rule out the red flags as well. The next one, we need to really identify features, key features that really differentiate one from the other. A person can either come with good uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease and or maybe an MI. How do we differentiate between them? Obviously, one is the radiation of pain, but people don't always, yeah, patients don't patients don't always present with that. So they're both positive and negative findings. And most of the times we need to really take them from history, exam labs, or the tests, or chart review. Then the next one, we need to really create a problem representation using semantic qualifiers. What are these? I will come back, I'll come to it in the next few slides. We need to really synthesize related findings into clinical syndromes. So whatever, whatever symptoms we really acquire from good history taking skills, which we'll, we'll develop as we start working, we need to really uh, group them according to whether it's severe or not, whether it's a red flag or not. Obviously, we need to adopt a framework. Uh, there are different types of frameworks that can be used. Some of them can be anatomic, some can be physiological. We as medical students are trained to really use the frame, uh, mnemonic called Vindicate, uh, which is a far more inferior way of really generating good differential diagnosis, because then we don't tend to understand the disease processes. And obviously, we need to apply key features to the framework. This generates the differential diagnosis. Okay, so how do we really generate a differential diagnosis? We always start with the problem. Always start differential diagnosis using patient's problems. That means symptoms. Don't jump into your conclusions. Once we understand, once we have a broad differential of the symptoms, then we can use physical exam findings, uh, which are our clinical findings, to really narrow down the differential diagnosis. And after that, we can possibly use labs and other tests to really come back to uh, diagnosis at the end. Once you have the patient's problem, we really need to describe it in a summary of one to two sentences using precise medical terminology. And what I mean by precise medical terminology is the semantic uh, qualifiers, which I have previously discussed here, which is generally creating a problem representation. Why is this important is because we as clinici future clinicians, we need to communicate in precise medical terminology. So what are the different semantic qualifiers that we can really use? Uh, first of all, what is a semantic qualifier? It's a qualitative abstraction of signs and symptoms of a case in which an opposing abstraction is either explicit or implied. Generally, uh, this is too long, but let us shorten it. It's generally precise terminology that is really used to describe the patient's symptoms. So common categories of qualifiers, it could be onset, uh, which could be abrupt, progressive, acute or chronic, course of the symptom, which could be continuous or episodic. For instance, cholecystitis or cholecystitis. Cholecystitis could be continuous pain. Cholecystitis could be episodic pain. Sight, 
unilateral or bilateral, proximal or distal, diffuse or localized, symptom trigger, postprandial, exertional, pleuritic, or positional. For instance, uh, duodenal ulcer versus gastric ulcer. Does it exacer exacerbate with meals or does it get better with meals? So according to this, we can really understand what is going on and we can describe it in precise medical terminology. So let us practice for now. For the last 30 minutes, my chest hurts when I breathe in. How would you really describe this in precise medical terminology? You can write in the chat box or use the mic. Acute. Acute what? Chest pain. So, yeah, 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 correct. Acute chest pain. And the next one. Uh, over the past several months, I have been feeling weakness on both my legs. Describe this sentence in a precise medical terminology. We can, I can go back to the next slide, so possibly, unless you saw the answer. Yeah. 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 Any ideas or thoughts? I saw it in the form from chronic bilateral weakness. Yes, perfect. Uh, so it's obviously acute chest pain and chronic bilateral weakness. So how would we really develop this approach of re really using precise uh, medical terminology? It obviously comes with good history, history taking skills and eventually with practice and clinical experience. Uh, but obviously when we are doing our clinical experience, we need to really keep these thoughts in our mind. Yeah. So what are the essential points to remember when generating good differential diagnosis? Number one, it should be really broad. Should include all the dangerous etiologies if missed, the patient is in danger. Prioritize in descending order of likelihood. And it should, be, it should also include diagnosis with low likelihood. The purpose of this is to really broaden your differential diagnosis in terms of when you don't come to a clear understanding of none of, this, none of your differentials are really causing the syndrome, syndromes that the patient is experiencing. So when I speak about red flags, uh, what do I really mean by red flags? Let's say a person comes with headache. What would the red flag be? What would I need to rule out immediately? Neurological diseases, meningitis. Okay, okay, and but meningitis is more of a chronic uh, kind of thing. So headache would be possibly yeah, but yeah, meningitis. What else? Stroke. Okay. Any other thoughts? Thunderclap headache. Yeah, yeah, subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, which is quite essential to rule out as well. Perfect. Okay, now let's say a patient comes with abdominal pain, uh, maybe chronic abdominal pain then eventually it became worse. That means suddenly he has diffuse pain. What could we think of? As a red flag. So could you repeat that? So a patient comes with, uh, he has been having abdominal pain for the last 10 days. Uh, but maybe two, three days ago, it became worse. And yesterday, he has diffuse peritonitis, diffuse peritoneal pain. He can't move. He, he's exaggerating. He's screaming. And it's really painful when you touch the abdomen or palpate the abdomen. So what would your differential be? I mean, peritonitis, uh, perforation of the intestines. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, definitely. Bleeding, peritonitis, perforation. So yeah, at the see, yeah, correct. All of these are right. So the aim of really generating differential diagnosis is to rule out one number one red flags, number two to make sure the patient is not in danger. So that's the actual aim. Uh, it's not necessary. We should come with the diagnosis on the spot because it's very hard to really come with the diagnosis, uh, which comes with years of experience. Our aim as medical students should be really be able to generate a good differential. Okay, next one. How do you think we should prioritize in descending order of likelihood? So how do we really determine likelihood? For instance, uh, one point would be age and gender. 
Second point would be past medical history, choose, and you should choose the really relevant one. Primary symptom using symptomatic qualifiers and highly relevant diagnostic data. So age and gender is really important. Why? Because a person who presents with chest pain at the age of 20 would be really different to a person who presents with chest pain at the age of 60. Although it doesn't always have to be a centralized chest pain radiating towards the hand, right? So we need to really determine whether it's an, whether the person who's 20 is really facing MI or not. He, he'll be most likely facing good. Whereas a person with 60 will be facing MI. So we need to really take care of that. So at the end, it really depends on risk factors. We need to, again, it comes back to history. So risk factors, age, gender, lifestyle, uh, past medical history is very important. We should, we really need to focus on the relevant ones, which we learn along with time. Yeah, uh, the next one would be, so strategies for coming up with a differential diagnosis. So as I previously discussed, there's several frameworks which comes with differential diagnosis. One is symptoms complex, uh, maybe like Charcot's triad, Reynolds pentad, or maybe typical symptoms of MI, uh, local anatomic approach, systems approach, and mechanism approach. So there is there is a good there's a good feature in one of these, and also most of these some of these have really uh, limitations into them. So in a symptoms complex, we really need a wide database because we can't really wide database of knowledge in our head, which is quite difficult uh, to grasp at first. And we really need a lot of clinical experience. Although we need to obviously rule out the red flags. For instance, cholecystitis will present with the right up, uh, upper quadrant pain, with pain radiating towards the shoulder. And obviously sometimes uh, jaundice or not, depends on the, uh, depends on the situation. Local anatomic approach could be maybe with abdomen. It could also be maybe with your throat, for instance. Systems approach. This is most commonly for chronic diseases, for instance, or very vague symptoms. Vague symptoms, uh, what would you define as vague symptoms? Like, could you give me some examples of vague symptoms? Uh, maybe fatigue. Fatigue is a very vague symptom. Or even weight loss is a very vague symptom. And mechanism approach, which I'll come across that very soon. So yeah, uh, the slide is here. Symptoms complexes include symptoms or syndromes that could be used for anything. Local anatomic approach could be used for sore throat, chest pain, abdominal pain. S systems approach, if it is vague, such as fatigue or fever, Approach by mechanisms, it could be either jaundice or amenorrhea. And physiological approach could always be used in hypoxia and hypoxemia. So let's talk about local anatomic approach. For instance, sore throat, what would you think of? What are the differentials you think of? Viral infection, upper respiratory tract infection. Yeah. Uh, tonsillitis. Uh, yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mono. Yeah. Yeah. Mononucleosis, laryngitis, uh, several other factors, maybe retropharyngeal abscess, all of these things. But now, since we all know that we are taught with this mnemonic called Vindicate, which which suits better? Either should we use an anatomic approach, or should we use vascular infectious etiology, uh, neoplastic, which is easier, or which is much more helpful? Strongly, I believe it is obviously, it's obviously a perspective. Uh, it's the anatomic approach for this symptom. So every, every symptom will have a different approach. And there's no hard and fast rule that you have to stick to this approach. It could really be uh, dependent upon your comfort and according to what is really suitable for you. Next one, for instance, mechanisms of amenorrhea, what would you think of in terms of differentials? Uh, any answers? 
uh, pelvic disease. Uh, do you mean by uh, oh the mnemonic one? Right? Yeah, yeah, pelvic disease. Yeah, maybe that could be for like if you have pelvic pain, uh, we could think of an anatomical approach. But if we have amenorrhea, we need to really think of a mechanism approach. So, for instance, the hypothalamus works on the pituitary, and the pituitary works on the gonads, and the gonads works on the endometrium. So now we can think. So, for instance, if the hypothalamus is destroyed, GNR will be low. If the pituitary is destroyed, FSH will be low, and the GNR will be high. And if the ovary is destroyed, everything will everything will be high except for the estrogen. And if the endometrium is destroyed, maybe everything will be high. If I'm right. Yeah. Next one, let's talk about fatigue, systems approach. How do we really do it? Or let's take fever. Fever is much more uh, easier. Yeah, let's go with fever. Think systematically. That means uh, it could be CNS, it could be uh, metabolic, it could be abdominal, it could be, what else? I mean, infection in all parts, basically. Like yeah, infection. CNS infection. Okay. That's, that's right. Yeah, CNS infection could be one of them. And also uh, hypothalamic disturbances could be another, uh, another one. Then let's go with, uh, now let's go for GI. GI could also be infectious. Let's go with uh, metabolic, maybe hypothyroidism, or maybe diabetic ketoacidosis or Addison's disease. So these the systems approach is really used for very vague symptoms like for instance fatigue fatigue is a very vague symptom so we can start with uh git git possibly poor mal possibly malabsorption or uh liver disease or maybe kidney disease kidney disease that's the nephrology part maybe a renal failure or chronic kidney disease could lead to fatigue uh maybe neoplastic diseases which could lead to fatigue, or maybe CNS, the patient just has psychogenic fatigue. So for wake symptoms, I would suggest you should go from head to toe, which is the systems approach. You need to be able to cover all the systems very well. Okay, next one. So let us really practice the frameworks. Uh, so syndrome approach, Syn uh, the syndrome approach. So jaundice, fever, continuous abdominal pain, what it is. Hepatitis, or like uh, some liver infection. Hmm? Some liver infection, jaundice, fever, abdominal pain. Yeah, so it's a triad. It's a syndrome approach, which I previously discussed. It's a complex of symptoms that really point you to the diagnosis of the patient. So jaundice, fever, continuous abdominal pain. Yeah, we could obviously add hepatitis to our differential. At the end, we're just generating differential. So hepatitis. What else can you think of? Cholecystitis. Yeah, cholecystitis Cholecy could present. What do you say? Yeah, cholangitis. Maybe cholecystitis could also present with that. Yeah. So at the end, see, the point of this was to really uh, understand how do we really uh, use syndromes to really narrow down our differentials. But obviously this is hard because there's so many syndromes and we can't really think of so much at a short in a short span of time. But apart from that, uh, this comes with clinical experience and after years you can really point out and say, oh, this is the diagnosis. But as a practice, could you name me some syndromes or triads or pentads or some syndromes which are really typical for syndromic approach? Maybe like something like Charcot's Pride or Reynolds Pentad. Yeah, so maybe uh, I would suggest some, uh, maybe ovarian cancer, which could present with mixed syndrome, very pleural effusion, abdominal distension. Uh, and the plural effusion results. So that's mixed syndrome. And 
as I said, Charcot's tried, Reynolds Pentard, also chest pain radiating to the arm could be a syndromic approach, classic for MI. So all your classic symptoms, which we read in books, that could be the syndromic approach. Uh, fever, altered mental status, respiratory rate greater than 20, and systolic blood pressure less than 100. This is sepsis, also another syndromic approach. Okay, next one. Let's practice again. Fever, vomiting, and diarrhea. What would you think of? The eye infection? Yeah, gastroenteritis. What else? Oh, gas. Sorry for the spelling. <laughs> Maybe inflammatory process uh, of uh, exacerbation of Crohn's disease or uh, ulcerative colitis, fever, vomiting, diarrhea. We could also add that to a differential. What else can we think of? Maybe uh, cardiac embolism. Uh, to the superior mesenteric artery could also lead to the same thing. Yeah, uh, so that's one of them. So obviously the answer is something else, which is up to gastroenteritis, as you said. But at the end, the point is to really uh, come up with a narrower differential using symptoms which we already gathered in the past. Next one, fever and a red hot painful elbow. What do you think of? Well, rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis presence uh, could be an acute exacerbation of rheumatoid arthritis. Yes. Uh, what else? Yes, acute arthritis. Correct. What do, you, what do you mean by acute arthritis in terms of septic arthritis or aseptic arthritis? Yeah, septic arthritis. What else can you think of? Yeah, bursitis could also be one of them. But bursitis generally does not present with the cardinal signs of inflammation, which is red, hot, painful elbow. It would present with painful movements. So therefore, this is where our physical examination comes into play. So we'll obviously physical, uh, physically examine the elbow and if there is pain full on movement and if he's not able to have uh, a full range of movement. Our history will take into place in terms of considering the occupational diseases, if he's heavy lifting or something. So then we could think of bursitis. What else can you think of? Yeah, gout. Again, uh, how would we really differentiate gout from maybe septic arthritis uh, from the history? So what causes gout? We we'll think of that. So what questions will be asked? Or yes, yeah, uric acid, maybe a lab test. Uh, but also we could ask about his lifestyle, maybe if he's drinking too much alcohol, maybe he has had several attacks in the past and physical examination, if we'll be able to see uh, signs of chronic gouts or maybe acute gouts, gouts itself. But acute gouts present generally on the uh, toe rather than the uh, elbow. But yeah, uh, you guys are right as well. It's perfect. But the answer is septic arthritis. But at the end, the point is generally in differential. So next one. Cough plus wheezing in, in a three months old in winter in a pediatric patient. What could we think of? Yeah, cool. Okay. Okay, hemophilus influenza, pseudocoup, yes, pneumonia, correct. So now our physical exam will come into a play in this. So as we know, pneumonia will cause crackles, bronchiolitis will be visas, pseudocoup would be strider, along with hemophilus influenza, which would present with strider, and obviously would present most severely. And it's generally more common in children 
who go into play school. But obviously, vaccinations are there, so it's not really common. But yeah, so hemophilus influenza, the patient can't breathe properly and is about to choke. Strawberry, epiglottis, pneumonia, fever, crackles, and bronchiolitis, wheezes, and diffuse wheezes. So over here, we are using our physical examination and our history and the likelihood ratio to really come up with the diagnosis. For instance, as we know, hemophilus influenza does not occur in infants. Mostly it occurs in children from ages three to five who are not vaccinated. So yeah, that's the likelihood. Uh, pneumonia could occur in children uh, by RSV, for instance. So we could eliminate that or something like that. The next one would be bronchitis. We could differentiate both of these by our physical examination skills in which when we auscultate, one will have bees and the second will have crackles. So yeah, that's it. But uh, the answer is bronchitis, as you said. Perfect. Next one. Okay. Now we use the anatomical approach. Severe epigastric pain. What could we think of? Uh, okay, okay, acute pancreatitis. What else? Okay, stomach ulcer. What else could you think of? Could be just being radiated into the epigastrium. Yes. What else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could also be myocardial infarction, could present with the uh, epigastric pain as well typically in women. Yeah, so you all are right. Uh, this is a classic example of how to really use an anatomical approach. Uh, the sole reason being is it's just easy to understand what's going on. But obviously, uh, as we mentioned, acute pancreatitis and stomach ulcer, uh, perforation could classically both present with epigastric pain. It doesn't have to radiate to the back because that becomes a syndrome at the end. Uh, so how would we really, uh, differentiate between these two stomach ulcer perforation and acute pancreatitis any thoughts yeah, lab tests perfect at the end yeah true uh, so we do an x-ray to rule out perforation uh we'll do lab tests to rule out pancreatitis if it's present yeah correct okay but however, we do really face one limitation in the anatomical approach. For instance, a person comes with acute abdominal pain. What is the limitation I have to keep in mind in order to really prevent uh, severe deterioration of the patients? Like epigastric pain could also be a myocardial infarction, or it could also be chest pain radiating to the epigastrin, true. Could also be a lower lobe pneumonia. So we really need to uh, do a complete uh, physical examination, history, to really remove those limitations because they can present as limitations at the end of the day. And we need to keep those differentials in mind. Okay, next one, colicky pain in the right quadrant. What could we think of? Cholecystitis, correct. What else? In the right quadrant, yeah, appendicitis if the patient is pregnant. Okay, good. Cholelithiasis. Yes, yes. Yes, GI obstruction, possibly. Okay, so we would obviously understand the anatomy of the bladder, maybe the cholito, cholit. I mean, we understand the anatomy of the biliary tree, so we can really predict what's going on. They could present with uh, any of disease, disease in any of these structures could present with the same symptoms. 
because textbook symptoms and clinical symptoms really present differently, which you will learn over time. Uh, but this is to just give you a base of how to go about things. Okay, next one. Mechanism and physiological approach, hypoxia. Uh, give me a physiological approach of hypoxia. So when we're considering hypoxia, we could possibly think of a VQ mismatch, uh, a problem in ventilation, or a problem in perfusion, right? So that's the physiological approach. We could think of hypercapnia, that's the physiological approach. The reason of doing this is because when a patient comes to the a, uh, emergency department, you will obviously take vitals and he will obviously present hypoxia. The question is, we can't use other frameworks to really understand why he's having hypoxia. So it's good if we use the uh, physiological approach, for instance, the VQ mismatch. So for instance, perfusion, when would perfusion to the lungs decrease or be disrupted? Come on, you know this. Yeah, correct pulmonary embolism. And when would uh, ventilation to the, to the lungs be disrupted? Yeah, pneumonia could cause ventilation disturbances and cardiac failure could also cause ventilation disturbances because of pulmonary edema. Correct, atrial ectasis could cause uh, ventilation disturbances. Perfect. Yes, bronchitis. Yeah, airway obstruction. So again, uh, we also can combine two different frameworks. Uh, for instance, this is the physiological approach, but also we could combine uh, the anatomical approach, as I mentioned before. So as uh, Nader said, airway obstruction, we could divide into upper airway, lower airway obstruction. That's the anatomical approach. So we can combine two different things as well. You just need to uh, play around with things to really understand what's going on. That's good. Okay. And jaundice. Use the physiological approach to jaundice to really, or mechanism and physiology, mechanism of jaundice to really understand what's going on. So if you guys can tell me the mechanism of jaundice, why do we have it? Uh, I just want to know the mechanism, then we'll come to the differential. Yeah, pre-hepatic, hepatic, post-hepatic, post but mechanism could also be uh, how bilirubin is synthesized, how we have jaundice. So hemolysis in the spleen uh, causes bilirubin to be converted to, no, sorry, bilirubin to be converted to bilirubin. Bilirubin goes to the liver gets conjugated, conjugated bilirubin goes to the uh, biliary duct, biliary duct throws bile into the intestine, intestine absorbs some bile and it excretes, rest as stercobilinogen. Uh, the absorbed bile could either go into the liver or could go to the urine. So yeah, in this one, as we had mentioned, uh, it could be, there could be a problem in any of these steps of the mechanism. So therefore we have maybe an indirect bilirubinemia or a direct bilirubinemia. So for instance, if we have troubles in absorption, malabsorption, that's steatorrhea, what would the bilirubin levels be? Or how would it really affect the bilirubin levels? A person comes to you with steatorrhea, fat is not absorbed. So maybe most likely the bilirubin levels will decrease uh, because the bile is not absorbed and there will be an increase in enterohepatic circulation because the liver wants to conserve a lot of the bilirubin. So yeah, uh, hemolytic anemia could present with indirect bilirubinemia because it, uh, it overtakes uh, the conjugation capacity of UGT. And also, we could also divide uh, our jaundice into prehepatic, hepatic, and post-hepatic, as you said. That's also a very classical anatomical approach. As you mentioned, Ahmed Salman, so you're not really restricted to using a particular framework. Uh, so you can really use anything, on, but provided you get three, uh, three common rules obeyed. 
a broad differential, red flags are not ignored, and you don't miss out on many other things. Okay, next one, wake symptoms. Wake symptoms are generally very chronic, and we really need to use a systemic approach to really understand them. So for instance, chronic abdominal pain, how would you use systems that's including CNS, uh, endocrine, reproductive, everything, go through every system of differential. A person comes to you with chronic abdominal pain, what can I think of? Yes, possibly CNS infection that comes with the uh, GI symptoms. Okay. Could be psychogenic or something. Next, endocrine. Think of endocrine causes. Any endocrine causes of uh, chronic abdominal pain? Yes, hypothyroidism. Okay. And maybe hypothyroidism as well. What else? Yeah, chronic pancreatitis. Correct. Uh, but that's much more of a GI cross. But uh, chronic causes of endocrine problems, maybe hyperparathyroidism could cause chronic abdominal pain because of constipation and just decreased peristalsis in general. What else could we think of? I think so, that's it. Maybe diabetes. Diabetes could cause chronic abdominal pain because of diabetic gastropathy, if I'm right. And also we could think of Addison's disease. Addison's disease, uh, the chronic form could also present sometimes with chronic abdominal pain because of electrolyte disturbances. Okay, now let's go to the GI causes of chronic abdominal pain. Now you can list everything. Come on. One, uh, one Ahmed said pancreatitis. IBD, yes, what else? Okay, malignancy, correct. Other causes of malabsorption, perfect. Celiac disease, diabetes, gastroenteritis, okay, good. But gastroenteritis is mostly acute rather than chronic. Next. Psychogenic. That could come under chronic abdominal pain. Irritable bowel syndrome is associated with psychogenic causes most of the times. Okay, good, good, good. Next one. Now let's think about the reproductive causes of chronic abdominal pain in a female. Okay, ovarian tumor. What else? But over in tumor presence very late with the brown pain, but yeah, perfect. Next. Uh, yes, pregnancy uh, possibly uh, could cause with the brown pain, but that it's because of a GI effect of pregnancy rather than the pregnancy, the fetus rather causing abdominal pain. Salphonitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, correct. Next. Okay, and 
endometritis yeah chronic endometritis okay good next one may be uh, endometriosis if you hear of it uh, maybe adenomyosis adhesions in general so yeah as we as, as we are having a look uh, are we generating a broad differential diagnosis according to chronic abdominal pain what do you think are we generating a broad differential diagnosis uh, according to the symptom if you are we are using this framework now does it make sense that what we are doing right now okay 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 now give me muscular causes of chronic abdominal pain musculoskeletal causes of chronic abdominal pain <laughs> yeah possibly muscular hypertrophy i mean yeah a disease of a skeletal muscle uh okay myositis yes present with that dermatomyositis hernia okay hernia comes under uh, the uh abdominal causes of chronic abdominal pain in general perfect okay good and maybe myasthenia gravis or dermatomyositis or polymyositis could cause chronic abdominal pain as well uh due to its inflammation of proximal muscles good okay so obviously as we know we have generated a broad differential in this process so we went through every symptom of this vague every every system of this vague uh syndrome and we came across a uh, broad differential now we'll investigate further by doing our physical exam findings clinical findings and then again uh, narrow it down to lab findings what we suspect for now if you go to the uh, hospital with uh, i mean if patients when they are when they are admitted with uh, chronic abdominal pain or acute abdominal pain labs are done such as uh, liver transaminases alkaline phosphatases amylase lipase everything is done the reason being is we, it's the process of ruling out things so first the clinicians came with differentials now they use lab tests to really rule out these things so when you ask why should we do these tests is just to rule out other uh, causes of diseases that we can get because every every patient has a unique fingerprint to their disease presentation therefore we need to obviously narrow the differentials down uh, using further investigations okay now let's come to systemic approach of weight loss again reproductive everything reproductive let's say abdominal cancer yeah okay reproductive reproductive causes of weight loss yeah malabsorption syndrome gi syndrome maybe uh, diarrhea as well chronic diarrhea next one uh nephrology causes of weight loss uh that's No, nephrotic nephrotic syndrome uh, does not present weight loss. It presents with weight gain because we have water retention due to uh, water moving into transudates moving into the interstitial space because of low protein and bra system is activated. So it will present with weight gain and edema. But yeah, uh, maybe kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, uremia causes uh, weight loss as well because it just suppresses appetite. uh what else can we think of uh, in terms of cns causes or psychogenic causes of weight loss
Yeah, anorexia. Anorexia definitely causes weight loss. Uh, maybe depression. Depression also causes weight loss. Any psychiatric disorders could cause weight loss or weight gain, depending on the situation. Okay, next one. Reproductive causes of weight loss. Yes, uh, endometriosis. I mean, not wrong. It's right, maybe. Could cause abdominal pain and possibly fear of eating. Could cause weight loss. And ovarian cancer, yeah, cause weight loss. Any sorts of malignancies can, obviously, uh, that's the first thing to rule out, malignancy. Which could, any of these could cause weight loss as well. Yeah, testicular cancer could cause weight loss. Perfect, perfect. Next one. Okay, now... Hematological causes of weight loss. Yeah, possibly. Anemia could cause weight loss. Yeah, leukemia lymphoma could also cause weight loss. Correct. Again, so now this one, what is the red flag we really need to uh, rule out in chronic weight loss? What do you think? The red flag that we need to rule out and chronic weight. Yeah, perfect. Cancer. So we will do a variety of lab tests, take detailed history, again, physical examination, and then come across things. Okay. So in medical school, we are taught with this mnemonic, vindicate vascular infectious neoplastic degenerative iatrogenic. This is a framework that we are taught generally. However, the problem with this is we are really, really limited to words our thinking, and we don't really tend to think out of the box. So to think out of the box, uh, I would suggest you can mix and match different frameworks, uh, which we have discussed previously. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Which we have discussed previously. A minute. Yeah. Which could either be the symptoms approach, the local anatomical approach, systems approach, and mechanism approach. All of these things can be combined, mismatched, uh, combined, matched, and obviously come up across a very broad differential diagnosis. So... We are really not restricted to generating a good differential. We could really use anything. But a rule of thumb is to really understand which one suits the best. For instance, in abdominal pain, it's local anatomical approach. Chronic would be a different approach. Uh, weight loss, obviously, it's vague. So systems approach. And maybe any physiological process that is altered, that's the mechanism approach. So yeah, this is just an introductory lecture of the differential diagnosis series. And our future series will really uh, come up with symptoms to diagnosis, where we will give you symptoms. And then how will you logically use these frameworks, which will be applicable, applicable to really form a good differential diagnosis. That series will also contain case studies, uh, which will really help you generate that good differential diagnosis. So if you have any doubts, questions, and feedback, uh, and what do you think about this lecture? Was it helpful or not? Uh, you can... Uh, please write on the chat and yeah, uh, could it be, uh, I could improve on the next lecture if possible. Thank you, everyone. The next one should be in March. Uh, that will be done by an NHS doctor uh, uh, around 12 or 13 of March. So yeah, uh, you will uh, you'll be updated uh, through the UIMS uh, page. Uh, follow us on Instagram and obviously Facebook. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great day ahead, and me meet in the next uh, differential diagnosis lecture series. Have a great day. Goodbye. Take care.